Well, actually, why don't we have you guys just introduce yourselves individually, and then uh, we'll kind of get on to the VLA stuff. Sure. Uh, my name is Tim Faulkner. Uh, I am the uh, owner and team rep for the Chicago Iceman and a member of the board of directors for the Volleyball League of America. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Will Foley, um, also part of the VLA board, um, really uh, focused on um, making the league financially successful. Um, I uh, have a background in startups, in volleyball, and I get the pleasure of combining the two to, to help the league grow. Excellent. All right. Uh, the, the thing that I wanted to start with is kind of, is basically the start of VLA, the kind of the, like the forming principles or the foundational principles that you guys had when you put the league together. What was it you were, were after and kind of what was the, the mindset that you had in, in developing the league and, and kind of creating your, your path forward? I think one of the biggest factors on the volleyball side of it was we wanted to have teams that truly represented the areas that they were claiming to represent. Um, in former iterations of, uh, of professional leagues in the U.S., we had teams that represented different regions of the, of the country, but they had players that lived all over the country and just came in for an individual competition. And we really wanted to have teams that, so the Chicago Icemen, 99% uh, of the Chicago Icemen rosters consist of people who live and work in Chicago. Uh, so that way we're able to connect with the local volleyball community uh, and train together and be just a higher quality volleyball team. One of the, the, um, the, the other items that, um, in addition to what Tim mentioned around uh, really connecting around uh, the volleyball community is, is really the, the VLA's mission to, to grow the sport of volleyball using uh, professional volleyball as the, the means to do so. Um, is is the, the observation of, of today's market, um, which is um, that uh, screen time is up, um, people are uh, easily accessing um, different types of media through the low cost of production. And so uh, here lies uh, an opportunity that we saw, which is great teams like Tim and others uh, around the, the US that also um, are looking at audiences that want to watch volleyball. Uh, and so we're really trying to connect the, the teams um, that have those great connections in those local markets with um, our audiences by providing them a high level entertainment product that they can watch it at any time. Okay. So it's very much as a grassroots sort of philosophy of building up in the, in the community as opposed to say something like Major League Soccer, where, okay, we're gonna get a bunch of big investors and we're gonna build a league that we know is gonna cost us money for several years, 10 years, I don't, I don't even know how long that, that took for them to, to start turning a profit. Um, but they were, I mean, it was all billionaire owners, so they could, they could finance that. But you guys are looking at much more of a kind of a shoestring sort of thing, developing from the ground up and tying in, and I know some of the stuff that you've done ties in with clubs and juniors tournaments and stuff like that. Exactly. Building a strong fund foundation for the league. Okay. Yeah. And presumably something sustainable. Correct. Very much so. And, and you brought up MLS, which is definitely uh, an organization that, that we research and, and it took over 10 years to, to actually turn a profit on, on that particular league. And it was because that they, they, they really struggled with connecting with their audiences. And so when we look at the, the two sides of, hey, do we go and find investors? I would love an investor. So if there's an investor out there that's interested and has uh, alignment in our mission, then we will definitely entertain those, those conversations. But at the end of the day, it took the MLS 10 years to figure out how to connect with their market. We're starting with solving that challenge. We want to do that right the first time and not take 10 years of money that is essentially burned uh, because we want to do it the right way. And so connecting with our audience, growing the sport of volleyball is really the mission that will turn into a sustainable volleyball league. An investor is just going to accelerate those efforts. 
Okay. So how did how did this all come together? What's kind of like the history to date for VLA? Uh, well, the origins of most of the board and uh, the owners and team reps that we have currently um, had all been a part of previous attempts at professional leagues in the U.S. Uh, all five teams actually were a part of both PVL and uh, briefly were in the NBA. Um, and obviously the PVL ended up falling through after, I believe it was six seasons. Uh, and after a short time with the NBA, uh, we had disagreements on how we felt was the right way to build a professional league and operate as a business. Uh, so we decided to uh, start our own and kind of create, uh, create our league the way that we uh, saw it to be the right way to do it. Okay. So uh, when did you guys actually start putting the league together? It was fall of 2018 or 2019 is uh, is when things started to to accelerate. And so um, when we looked at uh, our inaugural season, um, it was all about uh, getting in front of as many people as possible. Um, that season was scheduled during a global pandemic. Um, so lots of things have have changed. But the, the thing that continues to be our, our core goal uh, is to, again, get in front of people that love volleyball. And our goal is to partner with as many people along the way that uh, support that mission and to help them grow as we help grow ourselves. Okay. Yeah, I saw that a lot of what you were looking to do was schedule matches at say juniors qualifiers mm -hmm. some of the big tournaments which obviously gives you kind of a baked in audience uh, unfortunately as you say that kind of went out the window is that something you're still you know hopefully we have a junior season this year maybe junior season will start in the fall of this year instead of in the spring yeah. like traditionally but are you still planning to go that route or are you progressing on to a different angle yeah, I think I think when when we we look at events, there's there's many types of events that that we can have, and so um, ideally, what we're looking for is how do we maximize the audience and and the viewership. And so, as you mentioned, John, um, having our events at junior events is a top priority of ours because we have the ability to be in front of so many people. The reach is so high. So it's really attractive for us to, to be there if it's possible. Um, and so we're also planning around other types of events. Uh, again, the, the single thread throughout is how do we maximize our reach across? And so we're looking at um, different volleyball hotspots. And so we're looking at different regions around the, the, the U.S. that have a really healthy volleyball community that is interested in getting in front of or have uh, or themselves get in front of really high quality volleyball. And so there's different markets that we're engaging with and looking for other partners that want to bring the talent that we have to the cities that they want to see that talent in. And so a lot of the conversations are early, um, but we are actively looking for um, clubs, regions, cities interested in having an event in their location. Um, then the, the next um, plan, because we're planning and hedging against all types of risk in a, in a global pandemic is um, how do we do it safely if uh, the global pandemic does not change? And so we are looking at um, doing um, a bubble-like event where we actually go and um, eliminate um, in, uh, in-person live um, attendees so that we can make sure that the public and our players are safe and have our reach primarily focused on the digital side. So live streaming, social media reach, uh, and really focusing on providing high quality volleyball to audiences um, around the U.S. and the world um, in a really safe way. And so those are kind of the three types of events that we're looking at. Um, for the upcoming season. And really what we're kind of waiting to determine is 
what's possible with the outside constraints that a global pandemic presents itself. Yeah, aren't we all? Ugh. The big challenge of our time, apparently. Uh, is it is it the idea that eventually you'll get to the point of being kind of a traditional league, where you've got you know home and away schedules, maybe playoffs in some structure or you know some other standardized format, or is it your vision for at least a while anyway that it's going to be a lot of this event driven sort of uh, sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, describe what tradition means. And I think you kind of briefly talked about a home and away schedule. I think, um, you know, when I think about traditional sports leagues, they've had 100, 110 years of legacy um, viewership that allows them to um, exist and, and, and have that, that legacy um, or traditional sports view. Um, where from a startup perspective, a, a grassroots perspective, I think we have a lot of opportunity and flexibility to do both uh, or to pursue one or the other, depending on where the markets exist. And so we recognize that the greatest thing that we can do is get in front of as many people as possible. Uh, what are our biggest reaches, so looking for those markets, but providing us the flexibility to also be able to adapt to those market changes, which are happening quickly. You see the NBA is down in Orlando. You see other sports uh, trying to adapt as well. We think moving forward, the greatest asset that we can have is staying flexible and allowing us to really um, adapt to the changing environments. Okay. Uh, have you, obviously, you know, the big news earlier in the year and to a degree still is the Athletes United, uh, the thing that they're doing on the women's side, which is kind of that bubble. I consider it more of an event than a league because it's, it's fairly constrained. It's in one place. Yeah, it happens over, I think, what, four weekends or something like that. Um, have you looked at that sort of stuff or have you talked with, say, the group that Dave Shoji is involved with on the women's side in terms of what they're trying to do and anything that you guys might be able to do together or, you know, share ideas or anything like that? We have definitely been doing our research as far as the other leagues that are coming up. Uh, we have not been in contact with either of the other two efforts. Um, I, I kind of agree with you where that the athlete, uh, sorry, Athletes Unlimited is a little bit more of an event. Uh, both in the time span of the of the league and the nature of how limited in the amount of players that they're going to have involved in the league. Um, but we're very much open to um, getting in contact and potentially partnering if it, uh, if it fits for both communities. Okay. Yeah, I'd be curious to see where, where Shoji's group goes because I know that when we, we, we talked with them a couple months ago, I think at this point, they were looking at locations so some of them presumably probably overlap with the, some of the locations that you guys are looking at as well. Mm -hmm. Which Very case, much so. Great. I mean, <laughs> to the extent yeah. that the two organizations can coordinate and, and be better than each trying to fight things out separately, that'd be fantastic. Yep. Better for the volleyball world, better for all the players. And, yeah. and, and it's, it's hugely, hugely encouraging to see um, the league cr uh, be created. Uh, when, when I look at um, the, the marketplace, it's validating that the time is now. It's the right time to bring professional volleyball to the U.S. and do it the right way. And having another league come into play helps validate that assumption. Um, so it, it makes it really exciting time to, to be part of the VLA because um, our beliefs that it was the right time have been validated by, um, by the second league being created, which is welcomed um, to, to the volleyball community. Well, one thing that you guys are always up against being on the men's side is the fact that boys and men's volleyball in this country is still a fraction of what it is for girls and women. Uh, so is that, is that something that you're finding to be a challenge in terms of where you look to put, put on events and develop teams and, and things like that? Or 
is that not something that you're, you know, really having to, to deal with because volleyball is volleyball and people want volleyball? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. So, um, I, I see that as a, a, as a huge area of opportunity, right? We know that the volleyball sport is hugely popular on the, the women's side here in the U S when you go outside of the U S and you look at men's and women's volleyball in Europe, in Asia, you don't see that disparity. And so what that means to, to us at the VLA is a huge opportunity to right size the ship, that participation gap between the women's and the men's uh, here in the US. And that's just fuel to the fire that we're really trying to, to create here, which is that disparity, I don't see being uh, there in the next decade. And that's something that uh, we think is really an opportunity rather than a challenge that um, it, it's just the facts that exist today. And we're looking to, to change those facts with really putting professional volleyball on the screens of Americans, making it really easy to understand what the sport's all about. And with the unprecedented growth that we have seen on the boys' side of volleyball in the, in the U.S. the last decade, um, you know, one of the great things that we've seen is that the major hubs across the country that are predominantly known as women's or girls' uh, hubs have all are all really looking to grow the sport of boys' volleyball in the area as well. And the problem that they have is that they don't have a local college team like Chicago. The wonderful thing about the volleyball community there is that we have Loyola and Lewis and Ohio State is not, you know, it's not far away. And we have all these major programs where people are able to go and see high level volleyball. And those w girls volleyball hubs across the country are looking for for that inspiration. And uh, we've been contacted by several groups uh, to bring our events to those areas. Yeah, I spent a couple of years down in uh, South Carolina. And I know there was a push to be developing boys volleyball at the high school level. Um, which obviously then would certainly feed in the club side of things. And you would think it would be a prime area for that based on exactly what you just said, because you have Conference Carolinas down there. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Division Two. That's going to be – it's not going to be obviously the highest level of volleyball compared to UCLA's and Stanford's and all that. Not that Stanford has a program right now, um, sadly. But at least it is – it's good representative volleyball for people to aspire to. Mm-hmm. And over time, those programs will get stronger and stronger. And, you know, uh, the higher level players will start spreading out across the entire country instead of just constantly going East Coast, Midwest and, and West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, at, this, at this point, what is the type of player that you guys are attracting to the league? Uh, I find that a lot of the players that we have are... I mean, if you look at the individual roster of the different teams, we have a lot of like really high level players who were very successful in their college careers. Um, uh, I couldn't tell you the exact number, but a decent amount of our players uh, tried to play professionally overseas. And, and when I say try, I just mean uh, a lot of them played for just one or two years and realized that living overseas and being away from their friends and family uh, was just a little bit too difficult for some of them. Uh, others uh, wanted to be a little bit more community, uh, sorry, career oriented uh, when they left college, but still have a strong passion for the sport and, and train and want to compete at a high level. Um, and so the, the, the caliber of player that we're getting is actually, has been very good. Okay. What's, what's the sort of uh, schedule for these guys? Um, for you know training and all and all that because as you say if you have a bunch of them are you know working and having careers then they're going to fit that in around that so uh, what does the time commitment look like at this stage the season that we're looking at right at right now is january through july um, and with it being event-based it makes it a little bit easier on everybody having full-time jobs mm -hmm. uh, obviously as we down the road if we end up turning towards individual matches you know kind of home and away matches like we spoke about before um, it'll involve a different time commitment, but at that point, we'll also be in a point where we'll be able to financially compensate the difference in, in time. Uh, so for the teams and players right now, um, our preseason is basically the winter time and kind of training and getting ready uh, in, the, in the winter pre-competition, and we basically train throughout, um, throughout January to, to July. Okay. Yeah, related to that, one of the things that always seems to come up in these conversations about leagues and I've been in some of them myself, is 
when do you schedule them? And because obviously, because you guys are tying in with like the juniors events, you, you know, you've got that schedule pretty much set up. But you know, if you're if you're if you're looking at kind of the more the league idea, all right, do you want to compete with women's volleyball in the fall, or do you want to compete with men's volleyball in the spring, and all the different events? And, and, and obviously, then you're also competing with every other sport on the landscape to a greater or lesser degree. Um, how does that sort of stuff factor in to how you guys think about the future? I think there's there's a few ways to 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 look at that, and um, one of the ways that that we see Tim Tim called out uh, January to to July. Some of our players um, actually come in second half of the season, which is really exciting because we give them a platform that uh, allows them to continue to play their professional career overseas, but come in uh, after their season's end, which is typically April, sometimes May, but then we get to extend that for them so that they can work on skills with different players to then better themselves in their next season overseas. And so we see one side of the equation, which is how do we tap the right people from a talent perspective and really create a high quality product for our audience. The second aspect which you called out is, is, is competing with other sports, right? We don't wanna compete. If you wanna go watch football or you wanna watch college volleyball or you wanna watch college basketball, go do those things, right? We are looking at a demographic that actually prefers to watch volleyball. Those are the people that we're trying to put ourselves into. And so that's why, as you called out, John, it's so key that we're in front of the people at those junior events, which is why it's so awesome to have great partners um, to do so. But it's also equally as important to take that broader view, as you called out, that looks at, hey, what's going on in the rest of the sports? Where's the lull in actual competition that we can actually fill with our product. And so I see an opportunity, which is why we end our season in the July timeframe, where we're not competing with any of the major sports, right? NFL is not going on, NBA is finished up, NHL. We're looking at really only competing with the MLS, if you consider that a major sport these days, which has grown in popularity significantly, but there's a lot of opportunity to get airtime, screen time during that time period, which is where we're putting our playoffs, which is why it's so exciting to have a schedule that kind of gains the traction of getting eyes on our product at juniors events, but then gives them something to watch during the the summer months that doesn't compete with a lot of other high quality sports entertainment products. Right. The great thing, curi- okay, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say the, the great thing about it, too, is the fact that, you know, the, the following for collegiate sports is, is growing and growing as well. And, you know, with our leagues that are with our league that's going on now, fans will have the ability to continue following their favorite players from college as they progress into the VLA and compete beyond college. And it'll be easier for them to watch matches uh, both online and eventually in person once we get past uh, the pandemic. Right. Right. Um, I, two things that come up. One of them uh, is, is you brought up the idea of, of partnerships. How tight in are you guys on a kind of a functional basis with local juniors clubs? Yeah, great question. So um, some of our teams are an extension of the junior program. So uh, LVC is an extension of the junior program. That's a team run by Chris Hosley out of Uh, upstate New York. Um, Lloyd Ball's team, uh, Team Pineapple, is run out of uh, his club team, BSA. Um, And so we have strong ties at the junior level with the clubs that we have in most areas. And so that's something that we're continually cultivating is the local interactions in the markets that those teams are are part of because again we're looking to grow the sport of volleyball and it's using kind of the professional platform um, to do so and it's so fun to see the connection between those players and coaches helping the juniors grow and develop while they support us 
with uh, our professional volleyball entertainment product with the likes, with the comments, and with the views that, that they provide us. Yeah, I know Mark's got a couple of things he wants to, to jump in with, but uh, before I do, before I throw it to him, uh, one question on, on streaming. Do you have a sense of what that viewership is like or what that potential viewership is like at this stage? Yeah, um, from a viewership perspective, um, there's a lot of ways to, to cut it. So I think when, when we think about what is the market, what is the total addressable market of the volleyball world, it's a very, very high number. So we think when there's uh, a potential for volleyball to be um, most certainly a multi-million dollar industry to even upwards of a billion, right? And you can look at the numbers um, that, that we're looking at, which is viewership during um, the Olympics, uh, volleyball, um, indoor volleyball is one of the highest sports. Um, you look at the growth of volleyball at the, um, uh, the men's uh, levels, the boys level and the high school recently. Uh, and then you combine that with the junior, the girls programs, which is the number one high school sport um, by participation. You see that there's millions of people that play volleyball. We just need to get ourselves in front of those people which is why we want to be at the events that those people are at. And so when we think about how we are looking to take, hey, where we think the top of that market is and how we get there, it's all about being able to put ourselves in front of those people at the events that they're already at to take our viewership and, and grow it to the, the couple million that uh, we think we can do in a, in a couple years. Okay, good. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, I had, there's a couple of things that come to mind as we go along, but, but uh, segueing from, or, uh, from that, that last point, and it's certainly true that, uh, that volleyball has a big potential audience in terms of people who are interested in volleyball, uh, people who like volleyball when they see it, and that's a that's a kind of key point because that you're talking about um, about being in front of people. They like it when they see it, but don't see it very often and don't seek it out. So that's it's it's um it it it's a great point, Mark. Um, and I think um, the the biggest challenge when you look uh, so that's even, one this is even worldwide uh, that that. Uh, the problem that volleyball typically has is separating those people from their money, to put it in a really blunt way. So uh, that means paying to go to see matches. That means uh, spending money on sponsors' products to make it worthwhile for a sponsor to be, to be involved. And so... Uh, I don't know if it's a if it's a if it's a question that you can answer or just me making a statement. But uh, you know, what uh, is that something that, that you guys are aware of, or or um, are, are part of the considerations? Because that's what it comes down to in the end: is these great volleyball fans actually spending money? Totally. Um, it, it's, it's what I obsess about. It's, it's incredible that when the volleyball community is so strong and so passionate about the sport, um, why hasn't this been uh, created yet? Why hasn't a professional volleyball been uh, successful? And the reason that I obsess about it is because I think there's the answer to figuring out how to be successful with exploring why other leagues haven't been. And so the first point that, that I continue to, to look at is, hey, even 10 years ago, technology has changed so significantly that the production costs, the amplification, the platforms that are available, the reach that technology provides right now has lowered the cost has significantly reduced the barrier that previous leagues had to really battle against, which is very limited channels to get on NBC Sports, right? Um, we don't need to do that. 
the internet is an amazing tool that allows us to really lower the cost, but still provide a high quality product. The second aspect is why do people love playing volleyball more than they like watching volleyball? And that is a question that I obsess about. And I think when we look at the volleyball community, the volleyball community is so tight knit because people love making friends. Instantly, when you go to a volleyball tournament, you play, you hang out, you enjoy a lot of time with your friends, socialize. That is the exact environment and exact experience that we want to provide our audience when watching our product, watching volleyball. Come watch volleyball because it is the tool that allows you to go and communicate with friends, meet new people, go on adventures together, and we want to make it very experiential. So it's not just about watching our product. It's about engaging with it, taking it as an opportunity to meet other people and have amazing experiences with those people. Cool. That that sounds like uh, some way towards that or some uh, uh, path towards that solving that problem that age-old problem and it's not only an american problem it's uh it's the uh, i i live and work in europe and we and here in in poland where i am where that's one of the strongest leagues in the world and uh it's volleyball is a really important cultural culturally uh sport in in the country and but most of the teams get the bulk of their funding from the city that they live in, as in the city city government. And uh, even in Poland, they haven't figured out a way to really sell volleyball, even though it's on TV eight games a week, uh, pay TV, but TV. And so that's a that's a really key uh, interest interest for me. And one the the other the other point is that. Uh, or the other thing that comes to mind, you have the the existing clubs, the community-based clubs, the people where the players are related to the uh, or connected to the communities that they're they're playing in. Uh, how do you in you envisage that developing? Because as the as the league becomes more professional, has more opportunity for uh, for money. Uh, for for salaries for players etc at some point there's likely to be a movement to bring players from outside and possibly even uh, players from outside the US um, do you have a you know a model for how that transition might occur yeah I so um, really I'm, I'm really looking for a job by the way that's the that's the that's the point I'm making you you got it. Um, uh, we'll, we are always looking for great talent, um, in, in all forms. So, um, happy to have you, Mark. Um, the, to, to your, to your question about, um, Hey, how do we kind of create a successful, sustainable league? Um, knowing that it's a worldwide challenge of, of volleyball leagues that right now even some of the more successful leagues have um, funding through, through states. Um, when I think about volleyball and professional volleyball, what we are really is an inter- entertainment product, right? Our entertainment product attracts eyes and ears and followers and fans and people that really love the content that we are creating. And so there's two sides of that market. And so one is how do we attract those eyes? Um, And one of the things is, hey, you know, we can get people to really want to come and, and pay for tickets, right? Pay for the content that they view. What I think actually exists more is how do we actually just get an amazing follower to a volume that makes sense for 
outside companies to come and invest in because they also want to get in front of those people. So how do we create an amazing product that we get millions of millions of followers to follow so that we can now engage with partners and corporate sponsors to come in that are looking at our core followers as people, target markets of their own products. And now we create a cohesive partnership with those companies and those entities to start working together to monetize the, the community that has brought people together to view this amazing product uh, that creates a sustainable way to grow a professional volleyball league here in the US. It's a delicate balance, but I see it as kind of two sides of the, the equation, which is, hey, we need to grow viewership that viewership then leads to value uh, for other companies and entities that are also looking to get in front of those, those individuals. And Mark, I think another, uh, you also kind of posed the question of how do we maintain those connections with the volleyball community as our players are rotating in and out on our rosters and we, you know, if, we get, if and when we get to the point of having uh, international players on our teams, and I think our focus is always going to be maintaining the connection with the clubs themselves and not depend on the player, not to plan, uh, depend on the individual players and their relations there. Uh, so like the Iceman are working with multiple clubs throughout the Chicago area and, you know, running skills clinics and coaching clinics um, and just being as involved and present in the volleyball community outside of our actual volleyball matches and competitions. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, to the point about um, the, the kind of atmosphere that you're looking to to develop. I mean, there's, there's, there's two parts of this, but I'll start with this. One of the, one of my first thoughts when you were describing that, well, was the AVP of the '90s when it was really <laughs> successful, and it was it was an experience. Going to an AVP tournament was a cultural experience. Is that kind of the model? You're you're obviously a different setting, but the sort of concept, the sort of idea that you're after? Very much so. And it, it, it almost reminds me of the days where I would travel with my teammates to volleyball tournaments for hours and hours and hours. And what I remember outside of, you know, having a great time on the court, it's just the experience that I got to enjoy with my friends on that journey. And so that's a similar environment that I think will be really successful with the VLA is creating that environment where everybody's just having a good time, right? Other people attracting similar interests, getting together, having fun, and creating bonds that last a lifetime is something that we really want to create for, for our friends and, and fans. Um, because we think that that's the reason that volleyball is so popular. And it's the reason that we think that we can turn professional volleyball into a very popular and successful, sustainable sport here in the U.S. Just out of curiosity, obviously FIVB has been doing a lot to try to enhance the match day spectacle, if you will, the experience, especially in arena for things like VNL. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts? Have you looked at that and, and what, what works and what doesn't work and how you might be able to take that and, and incorporate it to your own stuff? All the time. So um, one, one of the, the things that, um, that, that, that's so special about an event is, is creating a memorable experience. Mm -hmm. And so what, what is most important is that we understand what that memorable experience is that allows our fans to come back and ask for more, right? And so it's always going to be something that I think in order to be successful is always changing, always evolving, and it's always going to be a little something special, right? You're not going to know what happens or how it's going to happen, but it's going to be something that, hey, you know something fun is going to happen and we want you there to watch it and to be part of it because that's how we take that awesome experience of playing volleyball and turn it into the amazing experience of watching volleyball. The unexpected that you never can really plan for what's going to happen. You just know it's going to be a great time, which is why you're going to sign up for it. Mark, just just throwing it, since you've been in the gym for a lot of these FIVB events, do you have any thoughts on the stuff that seems to work well and what doesn't work well? 
the it's uh, it's really interesting because I was in VNL from the beginning. I was involved with some of the the meetings at FIBB where where they were discussing or at least explaining the the, the concepts and. One of the, the goals that they had was to make the experience consistent wherever you are. So the, everything at a VNL match, if you land in France or US or Iran, follows the same template. So you have a super spike and a monster block and, and all of those things. And uh, the, the, the announcers actually had workshops, so you know they were meant to... Uh, to work more or less in the same way. And the thing that was interesting for me was I personally find a lot of those things really lame, um, you know, monster block and everybody waves their hands and, and that kind of stuff. But with a skilled announcer, it was really interesting to watch over the course of a couple of days at because each each event was three days in one uh, one venue, how the crowd was more and more engaged as the weekend went on, as they they started to understand how things are supposed to work, and it was a really I I think it was a really effective driver of engagement of the crowd. So um, you know to that exact to exact point, that was the you know FIVB's goal was to make a McDonald's experience and uh, and I think that it was largely effective. Obviously, and this speaks to the, the point that I made before, that a lot of the times that we were playing in empty gyms because the, the fans would only come and watch the home team play, but when the fans were there, they were they were well engaged, certainly as the, as the tournament went on. Right. Yeah, I think Clayton uh, Lucas made a similar comment about the the in the, the local uh, commentators and, and and arena announcers and how the quality of them could really drive the the quality of the experience for each event. Uh, uh, there, you know, there were some really great ones who uh, who were able to to educate the crowd in the expectations and and it it never ceases to amaze me the the willingness of a crowd of people to do dumb things because they're in a crowd which you know they they enjoy that experience and it's better for the players and uh, you know, but you have to invest you have to invest time and time and effort into it well and it doesn't hurt when you got you know groups of guys like the Aussie bench dancing and keeping this the fans uh, entertained as well. We tried to do our bit. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, Will, you've talked a couple of times about you know trying to get the, the, the volleyball people, especially the participants, the volleyball participants engaged in VLA and, and, and as spectators generally, which, as you said, this has always been kind of the struggle of the sport. But what about the more, I don't know, external market, people who would be spectators just because they enjoy being spectators, not necessarily because they've been playing for 20 years or their kids play or something like that. So like the folks that, that will watch the Olympics, for example, because obviously, Olympic, as you said, Olympic volleyball is massive everywhere, but it tends to be event driven. And then that audience kind of dissipates. So do you guys have a plan in terms of trying to engage them and lock them in and make them a consistent part of the viewership and the audience? Yeah, we, they're out there. Um, they're they're out there. I hope they're they're listening. Um, when 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 I think about the the challenge, it's 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 about introducing a new product into a market. And so there's uh, in in other product launches, right? You have your early adopters. You have um, the the people that follow the earlier adopters, and then you have the the massive crowd that that follows um, the market trends, and then you have the late adopters, and so you have this beautiful bell curve of of the people um, that are interested in any product, and in this product, it's it's our entertainment product for volleyball. What we are really hyper focused on is those early adopters, and the reason being is that the cost 
and the barrier to attain those customers, those viewers, those fans is so small because they are so passionate about the sport of volleyball. From there, now we're going into, hey, all of the people that are playing volleyball as a activity, not necessarily that passionate volleyball player that travels the entire U.S. to play at all the tournaments, but maybe they played in high school, maybe they play in a rec league. That's our second target market. And then you got the third phase, which is, okay, we have people out there in the world that know that volleyball is an entertaining sport to watch, but we just need to get in front of them. But we recognize that getting in front of them is a little harder. So we're going to focus on our early adopters for the next couple, well, let's call it first two years, so that we have a strong follower in our league and we have a proven value to our sponsors. And then we will start accelerating into the other cohorts of um, the volleyball market. One of the ways that we're also addressing the, the non-volleyball fans is once we get them to come and watch our matches or watch our matches online is how do we get them to stay and continue watching and, and get invested in the game. And I think one of the ways that we can best do that is help them to understand what is going on out there. Because obviously there are a lot of phenomenal athletes on the court flying all over the place and the game can be very, very fast. But if you don't understand what's going on, you can kind of get lost in, in the speed of the game. And one of the ways that we're approaching that problem is we're changing for our uh, streaming and viewing of our games. We're actually focusing on the end line to end line view as opposed to the sideline view so that you can actually watch the system and the movements of each team as the play progresses. And like if you watch, a, if you watch an NFL game, they're going to have a play and then they're going to pause it. You're going to have a replay where they break down why this player moved here and what he was reacting to and, and what decision, why they were making the decisions that they're making out on the court. And we want to be able to educate those non-volleyball people as well to keep them engaged in sport. Mark, I'm sure you can, you can comment on that because you've been in the booth. Uh, but real quick, just for everybody else, like I said before, if you've got any questions, feel free to shoot them in. We're, we're about 10 minutes from an hour now, so we're not too far from wrapping up. Um, but yeah, yeah, Mark, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a, it's one of those eternal, eternal questions about the, the end line view. And, um, as a, as a coach and, a and a fan, no, let's, let's keep it as a coach the the end line view is the, is the, is the best view. So there's no real question about that. Um, but. Do you uh, do you know? Have you researched what the um, the casual fan thinks about that? And the reason that I ask is because if uh, if you want to buy a ticket for a match, the cheapest tickets and the ones that you can always get at the last minute, assuming it's not sold out, are the are the end view seats. The VIP sit in the middle. The the highest price tickets are in the middle, and there is a difference in the in seeing. I th I think in seeing and understanding the dynamic of the game, as distinct from seeing and understanding the tactics of the game. And I I think that in a telecast, and I've done a little bit of TV commentary. I think that there's and I'm a consumer. There's there's a balance between the two. That's a that's an optimal that's an optimal balance. Um, I, I might it might be that the reason that those seats are uh, more expensive is just because they're more expensive, and then and people follow the price. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I find it a an interesting juxtaposition. In what the volleyball people think compared with perhaps what the casual fan thinks. I think um, our understanding mostly is, I think for the people that are already familiar with the game, like they're more likely to be the, the, uh, the fans and spectators who are filling those courtside seats because it is the best view to see what's going on. Uh, and our focus on the, well, when I said that we were focused on the end line to end line view, 
um, we're not solely focusing on that inline to inline viewer. Like you said, we're uh, going to be focusing on finding the perfect middle ground between the two so that we can engage uh, both sides. I mean, ideally, when we when we have our events, uh, we're going to be packing those seats both on the sideline and the end. And I think in the in the broadcast lately, certainly FIVB, CEV, they've definitely done a, a much better job of incorporating the inline view mm -hmm. into replays and even sometimes during live play to give you a sense of all that sort of stuff. One of the interesting elements for me as a spectator has always been, I feel like men's volleyball is better in person because you can, you can experience the physicality of the game better when you're there than necessarily on TV, whereas women's, because it's, the rallies are a little bit more drawn out, the, the, obviously the athletes are not as physical. Uh, They're still physical, clearly. <laughs> Mark, you going to chime in there? I just think women's tends to be a little bit better for TV than, than men's. Not saying it's bad or, or one or is bad or the other is good necessarily, just some differences. Would you want to say, Mark? I just, I really like the, your choice of the word drawn out there. Other people say long. <laughs> That's a drawn out, actually. Different context. <laughs> okay. Um, just out of curiosity, you guys are putting out content now, and you have been for for a while. Do you have a sense of of how people have reacted to different types of content? Yeah. So, from a a, a social media perspective, which is where most of our content is is going, we also have a YouTube channel for everyone to 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 view our our content from a, a re, uh, recent July uh, event. Um, we know that um, what is working really, really well is condensed content with the highest action. So you think the NFL game that if you sat in the stands would take two and a half hours and you spend $50 in the nosebleed, and you need binoculars to see it you condense that down to about 35 minutes of play. And that's what people from our perspective is, is consuming. And so we have uh, player highlights, we have play highlights. So putting similar plays together is producing really high value reach for us. And, uh, and then um, we are also exploring condensing full games into really uh, compact, digestible uh, amount of, of content where some of our, our early numbers is saying, hey, in a five-set match that takes two and a half hours, we can get that down to about an hour and 15. And so now we're talking about different ways to take the same content but turn it into something new that allows us to really just touch other different people interest because sometimes two and a half hours is a long time for me i would love two and a half hours of of my day to be able to watch volleyball sometimes that's not possible so i'll consume it in the ways that are more digestible with the time that i do have so it really is about um providing content with the same volleyball over the same weekend in different packets for however our consumers want to consume it all right, I'm going to ask a question that uh, I think Mark may have a, a, a thought on. Um, but I'm curious to hear, because this possibly changes the perspective on, on at least one element of the game, and it's the one that gets criticized a lot on the men's side, which is missed serves. So are missed serves getting taken out of the condensed, condensed version of the game as kind of a time saver? So um, great question. We have not made the decision to remove missed serves. I think that um, what makes mixed serves um, not fun to view is the amount of time between the next serve. And so a missed serve is a huge moment in volleyball from my perspective, but we'll let the data kind of tell us after we, we pilot it, is that a missed serve is more or less a momentum swing, nuance to maybe someone that's not familiar with the sport of volleyball. But if a team cannot put a serve in, that is a huge, huge indicator of confidence of that team that allows for 
the other team to understand how much harder that they can press. And so I recognize that understanding that nuance of what a miss serve represents in the sport of volleyball might require the knowledge of volleyball at a higher IQ level. So not your passive volleyball viewer, but again, who we're focused with right now is those early adopters. And those are people that are really familiar with the volleyball product. And we think that they are going to be interested in understanding when a misserve happens, how did that affect the momentum so that we can then uh, display it as, as part of the, the content that, that we are producing. There you go, Mark. They're going to keep it in. What do you think? I'm a, I'm a big fan. Will, you're my favorite. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. You're hired. <laughs> I, I I agree. The I had a uh, was interesting. The the with the serving thing. I I had a kind of epiphany when I actually sat in a crowd at one point, and uh, in a in a pretty big match. And in the when you're sitting in the crowd, you feel the game in a different way than when you're a participant or even a you know a, a sitting behind the court or whatever. And the, the crowd, the ebb and flow of the crowd as as individual servers went back, you know, when a bomber goes back and there's a, a level of expectation and and the uh, uh, when your team is losing, there's, you know, the the real ups, ebbs and flows, like I said, of, of when serve, when a server goes back and the, the disappointment or despair or whatever that, that comes with an error is a seemed as a fan in that part in the in the crowd seemed like a, a really important part of the game that um is different from you know the straight technical that was an error uh part of it so i like that you recognize that or i you know it, it seems something that's that's worth recognizing sorry i don't mean to say just because you agree with me it's a good a good plan but you can and i appreciate it yeah <laughs> I, I realized that I just did say that, but I didn't mean to. I, I appreciated that. You can't take it back. <laughs> That's right. It's being recorded. We got it for all time. Um, all right. Is there anything that you guys want to, to, to leave people with in terms of what's going on with the league or where the league's going? Or um, another thing could be how people can help out, either growing the league or – working events or whatever it is to contribute to the growth of the league and, and by extension, the sport overall. Totally. Um, so um, reach out to us um, via social, uh, USA VLA on Instagram. Um, we have YouTube channels that you can subscribe to. Uh, info at usavla.com if you're interested in helping us uh, from a business perspective. Um, if you're looking to host an event in your city, reach out to us, info at usavla.com. Um, we are always looking uh, for people to, to help because we recognize that the sport of volleyball is such a powerful community, and we want to continue to grow that community. And what a community means to us is making sure that it's a super inclusive uh, environment that uh, everyone is is super comfortable with with being part of. So we welcome everyone um, to to reach out, to help, subscribe, to view, to click, to like. Um, all of it helps us. So if you're interested in helping, those are just some of the ways. And if you think you have a great idea, love to hear it. Good. All right. Appreciate the time, guys. Thanks for having Thanks, John. Thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Good luck. Good luck uh, and it. stay healthy over the rest of the summer. Pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you guys and uh, and good luck. I'll be I'll be watching closely. Thank you, Mark. Uh, go ahead and send us your resume whenever you're ready. You got our email. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. There you go. All, All right. right. Have a good one, everybody.